Man, I wasn't sure. Just get, let go of that. That's mine. <laughs> I wasn't sure when he said twins to feel like middle school. He Middle school can go, yes. <laughs> Y'all, we're professionals up here. We are on top of it. I wasn't sure when he said uh, twins to be like complimented or insulted. I don't exactly. That was supposed to be a joke, but it didn't fly. All right. So we are, we are in a series where we're talking about emotionally healthy spirituality. But before we do that, um, real quick, here at Living Waters, we so appreciate the partnership that we have with this, with this family to continue to do the work of ministry and the kingdom work that we're doing here. If you uh, like and are part of this community and you see what God is doing and you're with us in it, you have the opportunity to continue to give and to help support this church. Um, we don't send the baskets around, but what we do have is we have two black boxes on the side, on the back where you can drop an offering or you can give online or you can even text to give to help support uh, the work of Living Waters. If you text any dollar amount to 84321, that is another way to give to this church. So give to this church. In the name of Jesus. No pressure, no pressure. The, the Lord does love a cheerful giver. That's in the Bible. Don't blame Drew. All right. Um, we are talking about emotionally healthy spirituality. We've been talking about this last couple of weeks. And um, so that you know, uh, this topic of emotional, emotional health and how it ties into spirituality has been something that has been an, a hugely important part of my life over the last 25 years or so. And when we were singing that last uh, song and talking about the mountain, and I love what Ryan brought, uh, talking about how sometimes we're in the process of trying to climb the mountain, and that's not a mountain the Lord wants us to climb. It's one that he wants to move. And I think that w as we enter in this topic today, I want to share with you that my mountain was my history, was, was all of my life experience leading up to a moment in time. And I think for a lot of us, when we approach the topic of emotionally healthy spirituality. I think that it can feel like a mountain. It can feel like a mountain because what we're talking about is emotional reactions and responses. And for so many of us growing up, we were either afraid of emotions or we weren't trained how to understand or interpret our emotions or our emotions got us in trouble or they were unacceptable within the family that we were in or the parents that we had didn't know how to help us navigate our emotions or our emotions were a little too big. I've got a daughter, her emotions are big. And as my wife has said, with Berryessa emotions, how many of you are parents and you ever, like, you ever know that old nursery rhyme, going on a bear hunt? Anyone? You know, and, and you realize when you're doing this, you can't go, like, you run, if you're going on the bear hunt and you go and you find a swamp, you can't go under the swamp, you can't go over the swamp, you can't go around the swamp, you have to go through it. That's Berryessa emotions. There's no around, there's no over, there's no avoid, there's just get through it, walk through the emotions. And I think that for a lot of us as we approach this topic, I think that can feel like a huge mountain. And let me tell you why, and why we believe here at Living Waters this is such an important topic. Um, you know, often, at, at, at least at the church that I grew up going to over the years, I, I don't remember hearing a lot about emotional health. I learned a lot about theology. I learned a lot about memorization of scripture. I learned a lot about sanctification and holiness. I learned a lot of Bible verses and memorization and all those things were incredibly valuable and formative for my spiritual walk. But we are not just spirit. We have a body, we have a will and a soul, we have emotions and discipleship, if it's effective to the whole person, has to address our emotional being as well. Because God did not make us compartmentalized and he did not make us in a way of which only our spirit matters. Because that is a heresy called Gnosticism that says that the body and the material world doesn't matter, but only the spirit does, so only focus on the spiritual. That's actually Gnostic dualism. And that's not what we're going for in Christianity. If we are truly wanting to walk and look and behave like Jesus, then we have to take very seriously the commandments that the Lord leaves us. And when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, he referred 
to multiple passages in Deuteronomy. It was something called the Shema that was believed in the Jewish faith to be the pinnacle of faith. And you can see this quoted in Matthew 22. He says this, and you've heard me say this so many times. You know, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they got together and one of them, an expert in the law, testified, uh, tested him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And this is in Matthew 22. You can find it in verse 34 through 40, through 40. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind and all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Why do we here at Living Waters believe that emotional health is important to discipleship? Because if you are unhealthy emotionally, you're not gonna love people well. If you are unhealthy emotionally, you're not gonna love the Lord well. And sometimes the lack of awareness of all the things that are going on in our heart and our soul that come out in our emotions or come out in our interactions and relationship, that can feel like the mountain. Because when we're interacting with people, we don't understand where our reactions are coming from. Or we might even sing songs like that very song that we sang today. And internally, as we're singing those words, theologically, we might believe, yes, God can move any mountain. Yes, God can make water, you know, turn into wine. He can feed the 5,000. He can do all these things. But when I'm facing something, I don't necessarily go to the, the theological knowledge. I might go to the theological knowledge, and then I find this dissonance in my heart because my theological knowledge is running right into my personal experience, and my emotions begin to fight against the spiritual truth that I know spiritually to be true. And I know intellectually to be true because I've studied it and I know it and I know the character of God and I know the history of God and I know how he works and operates. But my emotions create a roadblock and a stronghold I can't get my life through. Amen? I know I'm not gonna ask for a raise of hands who's relating to that, but Mike is back there and I know Mike. <laughs> And Debbie, and yes, and all, and my dad back there, and it's hope, and everybody, we're all like, hey, 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 it's, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> so what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about the two kind of places where we have to understand the two battlefields. Actually, there's three, but I mean, the one is, it'll take care of itself. But the, the two battlefields that really, as we begin to wrestle through emotional health, and try to understand emotional health and how that plays into our discipleship, these two battlefields we have to address. The first and foremost is, I'm gonna call it the personal battlefield or the intrapersonal battlefield. It's the thing that's going on inside of me, like all this stuff. So we all have our histories that we walk into our relationship with the Lord and everybody else with, right? Correct? Thank you, Mike. I always love when Mike is in the audience. I'm like, yes, someone's listening. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Thank you. You used to be in the front row, and that was much more helpful to me because it was like, you know. Oh, thank you. Okay. But there's open chairs. I don't, I mean, not to call you out in front of everybody, but just kidding. I love that man. When we, when we begin approaching the internal world, this is where it can feel a little overwhelming because first and foremost, for many of us growing up, we weren't allowed to look at our formative years with anything but the lens of gratitude and appreciation. And even if you have a dysfunctional family background, if you have a dysfunctional family or a family where everyone's dysfunctional, it's really hard to be able to identify the things that are hurtful, the things that are painful, the things that are, that are wrong. And it can be even harder to address them because you're, you're existing in a system that is rigged towards dysfunction. And I know growing up, like, the last thing, and, and as a parent, the last thing that I want to do is throw shade or guilt on any parent in this room because to be a parent is to feel guilt. Amen? <laughs> like, when, when Susan and I started having kids, we were playing, like, Lord, we know we're going to screw them up. So can you just help us screw him up in a way that makes him quirky and interesting and not dysfunctional? <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> Thanks, baby. I appreciate it. <laughs> Weird number one. Weird number two got baptized today. Hooray. Weird number three is going to need it a lot someday. <laughs> 
But one of the reasons why I bring this up is because when we are addressing some of this, we are so unaware of the internal world in our hearts and our souls. We're so unaware of the filters that we're looking at. And yet it's such an, a, such an area of spiritual battle. Let me quote a couple of scriptures to you to give context for why this is important spiritually for our discipleship and eternally. Ephesians 6, 12 says this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. A lot of us have heard that. We know we're in a spiritual battle. And that's like, yes, we have powers, we have principalities, we have, we have rulers and we have authorities, and it feels like a Frank Peretti novel every time we're reading it, and there's a demon under every corner, and it's like, yes, let's appropriate the blood of the lamb and get on our spiritual armor. Yes. And 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Great, Drew, I've heard this. What does this have to do with emotional health? Because the things that we think inform our emotions. Because the experiences that we have that we don't even know are forming these strongholds or towers in our soul become those pivot points of way how we interpret our relationships, how people are treating us, how we respond when people treat us certain ways, where we go when we're feeling sad, where we go when we're feeling hopeless, where we go when we're in pain. All these things are built in these strongholds that are formed through our experiences and our emotion and our relationships. So it is the primary work of spiritual warfare to be emotionally healthy. I'm gonna say that again in case it did not sink in for some of you. It is one of the primary places of spiritual warfare to be emotionally healthy. Now, let me clarify something else. Emotional health and emotional intelligence are not the same thing. Knowing what your emotions are when you have them is not the same as being mature. How many of you can raise your hand and say, I know people who know exactly the emotions they're having all the time, but they're a train wreck. I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm very emotive. You can ask everybody who lives life with me. I'm very emotive. I have a lot of emotions. I generally know what my emotions are. But I'll tell you the truth that even when I could tell you exactly I'm angry or I'm sad, I couldn't tell you why. I couldn't tell you what the beliefs were or the strongholds were that were making a certain circumstance or situation make me feel insecure, make me feel angry, make me feel afraid, make me feel whatever it was I was feeling. Being emotionally intelligent and emotionally healthy are not the same things. Emotionally healthy and emotionally healthy people use their emotions and their emotional intelligence to help guide their decision-making processes leading to more balanced, mature, healthy, and abundant living. They, they work hard to identify the underlying beliefs and past experiences that influence the emotions that they're having. Rather than just having them and feeling them and responding, they peel back the layers of what's behind the emotion. Yes, I'm feeling this, but why? Looking past the what to see the why. Can I tell you that unless you are able to do that for yourself, you are not going to have the compassion or wisdom or ability to do it for somebody else. And so what you will do is you will hold people to the same prison you are in emotionally and spiritually because you'll see a reaction from someone and you're gonna judge that reaction through the lens of your own judgment towards yourself. And so when someone's feeling insecure, you're gonna be, stop feeling insecure. Thank you, all better. I mean, I remember there was a time where I was reacting to something emotionally and it was all based in history as most of the time it is. And I was reacting to something and uh, you know, in all honesty, probably it was this insecure feeling of when I first moved here, I was certain, certain that I would get down here and they would be like, oh, Drew was actually a lot more fun when he visited and went away. <laughs> Cause you guys, I visited down here for 10 years 10 years I would come down and I would share in the school of ministry and I would teach on emotionally healthy spirituality and I would teach on homosexuality, which 
for those of you who are new. I'm just saying that I don't want to have to continue to repeat myself 9,000 times. And this is actually very applicable because the first couple chapters talk all about the process I'm talking about today of looking past to understand the present and actually take thoughts captive and make them obedient to Jesus. Can I just say this for extra gravy? There is nothing different in sexual brokenness than any other emotional or relational issue. And Jesus' ability to heal or move or destroy or flatten or use that mountain as a foundation is just as real with that as it is with anything else. So if you want a practical example of what I'm talking about today, get the book for crying out loud. (laughs) Support your local Drew. (laughs) Anyway, I was feeling emotionally insecure about something. I was feeling like I'm going to get in here and I'm going to, you know, be going through the motions and I'm going to be about a year in and Ryan and Kate are going to be like, this was a mistake. And, you know, I was feeling insecure and everything that happened that made me feel disconnected made me that insecure flare up. Anyone have an insecure flare-up? It's like emotional psoriasis. And you're just like, this is ugly and scaly and it's gross. And I remember Kim, we were in a coffee shop in the Rise coffee shop. Rest in peace. Um, And she said to me, she's like, Drew, what you're thinking isn't true. And she was right. The fear that I had wasn't true. But here's the problem. It had been true before. See, some of us in this room have experienced, not some of us, all of us, everyone in here in this room have experienced moments where you've called out to God to answer something or to address something or to heal something, and he didn't. Every single one of us have had that experience where we called out to God with all sincerity and all hope and all faith, and we did not get the answer we thought we were going to get. And we are left to interpret that somehow. And depending on the experiences that we've had in life, we're either going to interpret that through a theologically sound lens and secure one, or we're not. We have to look back in order to understand the present. Now, for a lot of us, for those of us who might be visionary type people, we don't want to look backwards. We want to look forward. Like, what are we doing now? Let's move forward. How do we want to build this life? If you don't look back to understand the present, you're going to be building whatever it is right now on a foundation that is built on the brokenness and the strongholds of the past. And we, none of us want to do that. Here are some of the things, those, those roots of strongholds that set themselves up and affect our emotional development and affect the way that we interpret. Something called love deficits. These are huge. Love deficits are are this. God has designed every single one of us with the need and the requirement unapologetically for love and belonging, for nurture, for care. When those things aren't met correctly or fully, there's a deficit. Human hunger and human need is never going to be denied. It'll be met one way or another, but it won't be denied. And so when we have a love deficit... What we do is we interpret then through that lens, knowing the deficit is there, we interpret the love or the quality of love of the people that were supposed to give that to us, including God. And so we have a lot of judgments that then start flying out towards maybe our parents, our grandparents, teachers, coaches, God himself, pastors, ministers, everything, because we feel this lack and we're left with an interpretation. How do we interpret this lack? because I did not get what I was supposed to get. That makes sense? Some of us judge that lack and we judge externally the people who were supposed to give it to us. They were bad, they were wrong, they're unsafe. Some of us internalize it and say, we must be bad. We must be wrong, we must be unlovable. Both are strongholds that need to be corrected and torn down. Injustices, these happen to all of us some, some of us are bigger magnets than others for injustice. You ever notice that if someone, I don't know, I've noticed this in pastoral ministry, but when someone gets affected in a particular way, it seems like a lot of that comes their direction. So people who've been spiritually abused tend to be around a lot of people who spiritually abuse them. It's like the enemy tempts us to treat people in the ways that they've been most injured. By the way, so that you all understand this, The enemy tempts every single one of us to treat each other in the ways that we've been most wounded. 
So every time you run into that difficult person and you want to, your reaction, your natural reaction, which you know isn't godly, take a moment and realize that maybe that's one of the greatest places of their wounding and a huge stronghold that the enemy has over them emotionally. And maybe if we were to take that cue and instead of treating them the way that we naturally want to treat them, treat them in the opposite way that might honor God and heal them. By the way, do that for yourself too. Trauma. Many of us experience trauma. I won't go into that. Generational sin patterns. Generational sin is not just about like spiritual boogeymen. Generational sin plays out genetically in epigenetic expression. If you, any of you want to understand a little bit of that, learn about ACE scores and adverse childhood experiences and how pain goes down generational lines and patterns of behavior. The devil didn't make you do it. Sometimes literally, genetically, and historically, the pattern set for us, we just repeat. Soul ties, these, these, these agreements that we make and relationships that we make that have way more authority spiritually than they should. Where someone has been put as an idol in the place of God rather than God themselves. And honestly, for some of you in this room, you have soul ties you're not even aware of. Because once upon a time, you had a relationship where that person became your everything. And maybe you cross some physical boundaries. You certainly probably cross some emotional boundaries. And that relationship might still have echoes in your life today. There may be a tie that you've made, a bond you've made that the Lord himself would like to break so that you don't operate unhealthy anymore. Is this making sense so far? And I'm running out of time. So that in that personal responsibility realm, we have to go backwards to be able to go forward and understand. So one of the tools that I want to give you, a very specific tool, there's something in this book. And if you have not gotten this book, please get this book. There was one tool that was super revolutionary for me. It was called the 10 commandments of your family of origin. And essentially what it is, is you sit there and you say, okay, what are the 10 unspoken rules of the family I grew up in? Oh, this is going to be fun. (laughs) Just hearing the, oh, oh, no. Yeah. We have these rules that we operate within that we don't even understand that are happening. And honestly, any married couple, they're bringing in their unspoken 10 rules. And their spouse is coming in with unspoken 10 rules. And they're forming like 45 of their own. They don't even know they're the building. And down the line it goes. But if when we start to look at our life and our upbringing, and this is not all bad stuff. Sometimes it's very good. And honestly, can I tell you that Satan is so good at taking good things and manipulating them for the bad? Every time that we are in here trying to wrestle through something that's become religious in an unhealthy way, that is a good thing that the enemy turned for bad. Why do we not have the 10% tithe in this church? It's not because giving 10% is bad. By all means, give. I don't know if you heard me earlier, but give. Give. If you want to give 10, that's fantastic. 20 is even better. 45 is a minute. Just kidding. All that to say, that's not a bad thing, but the enemy takes good things and he manipulates them into feeling like bad things. Like, I I know so many families I ministered to where the parents were fantastic parents who had godly standards, but the enemy took those standards which were never devoid of grace or love, and the child interpreted them as pass or fail or performance. I'm loved when I perform well, and I'm not when I don't. So we have to look back to begin to understand what has formed us today. And I want to challenge each of you not a single one of you is off the hook. I'm looking at you, my in-laws, too. My in-laws are here because my daughter got me, and my and my parents, and my wife, and, yes, you too, and all of y'all, yes, I see you. All of us need to take the moment to look at this because if it is affecting the way that we interact with people, if stuff that we don't even recognize is a stronghold in our life and we're interacting from a place of pain or insecurity or brokenness in this world, it is affecting the way we represent Jesus to the world around us. And just so that you don't walk out of here with an enormous amount of guilt, God is bigger than our dysfunction. 
That's why any of us can dare to be a pastor in this church. It's like, well, I know I'm dysfunctional, but we, you know, <laughs> Jesus is bigger. You know, it's like, thank you, Jesus. But can I please encourage you guys to take time just to go before the Lord and to look at your family of origin, just the first 15 to 20 years of your life and go, Lord, what were the rules that I didn't even know affected me? Lord, what are the, some of the things that I was supposed to get in this experience that I didn't? And can I tell you something? Chances are, if you didn't get something in your experience, one of your parents didn't either. Which leads us to the next phase that I'm going to talk to you all about. It is one thing to go digging in our past and finding all the things that went wrong. And can I tell you that if you stop there, you're gonna, it's going to be a hard life for you. Because what that can do when we start to begin uncovering deficits and injustices is we can get really pissed off. Which is an emotion that the Lord is okay with. Anger is okay. In our anger, don't sin, but anger is okay. Anger sometimes is that indication that there's something wrong or a pain or a wound there. Anger can be instructive. That pain can be instructive. But if we don't begin to practice repentance and forgiveness and reconciliation, then we're going to be in a world of hurt. Let me break a few of those down real quick. Oh, Lord Jesus, the time. Let me break a few of these things down, and then we're going to ask the worship team back up. So first things first, repentance. Inevitably, when I began looking in the past to see where I was and looking at my history and looking at my development, um, there was so much pain that was, was in our family of origin, both, I mean, and way before even I was around, there was so much pain. And when I began looking at that, it is so easy to begin to assign blame. It's so easy to begin to like, get entitled and get offended and get into this hopeless place. Because not only does it feel like, how dare, and poor me, but now what, Lord? Because that can feel like the mountain too, of like when you begin to realize everything that wasn't done right or all the pain that is there and thinking, what do I do with that mountain? Can I tell you that the, the, one of the things that I would encourage us to do, because the Lord is concerned about how we love him and love others and ourselves, is that this practice of repentance became really important, that before I ever begin to address, and this is how I operate now, before I ever begin to address what might be the offense from someone else towards me, I want to look at my reactions, I want to look at whatever I've determined in my mind is, is my legitimacy for anger or offense. Because chances are I'm reacting wrong in my pain. Chances are I'm holding offenses and unforgiveness. Chances are I'm not looking at this through the lens of grace. I'm not looking at it through the lens of, but why are they hurting You know, I can get into a real offended and self-righteous and entitled place, but that's not going to heal anyone, including me. So the first thing that I want to encourage us to do is we look backwards and we start seeing this because honestly, the person that we are going to answer to for the Lord is just us. When we go before the Lord in glory, we're not going to answer for how my wife treated me or my parents treated me or my siblings treated me or my boss treated me. I'm going to answer for how I responded to everybody. And so the first thing that I, I want to ask us to do is when we're looking back and we start seeing maybe some injustices or some deficits or some things that just didn't go right, first thing is this wonderful prayer from Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart and test my anxious thoughts and see if there is any way offensive in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, confront my reactions first. Lord, how do I respond like you in this scenario? How do I go to you first with these deficits and these things? Because here's the deal. No matter who hurt me, they can't make it better. People that abused me can't undo it. People that rejected me or labeled me or hurt me, people that I did that to, I can't undo it. I can't make it better. Only the Lord is the Redeemer. 
And only in the Lord's hands can any of the wrong done or any of the emptiness that we've experienced, can any of it be redeemed, restored. And that is how he moves that mountain. Amen? But he is not gonna force us. He is going to partner with our choices and our emotions and our volition in this process. So first and foremost, can we go and say, Lord, in my pain, have I responded in a way that I need to repent of? Have I taken control of this circumstance in a way that has taken it out of your hands and put it in mine? Can I just say right now, every single one of us have. To one degree or another, every single one of us have. And before we ever address the stuff in someone else, what does the word say? Take the log out of our own eye first so that we will see clearly to address the speck in our brother's eye. So first and foremost, can I challenge us to go to the Lord and say, Lord, what in my reactions has been wrong and unhealthy? You know, repentance transforms our life. It transforms our values and our attitudes and our actions. It, it, it changes our entire being, our mind, our will, and our emotions. Because inevitably, when we start practicing this place of repentance, and then what comes with repentance, when we repent and f- allow the Lord to forgive us and forgive ourselves, then the grace that we can extend to others is magnified because those who have been forgiven much love much. So from that place of personal responsibility, then we look to the people in our lives who have hurt us. Then we look to the places in our lives where there have been deficits, or even we look to the places where we don't understand what God has done. Because sometimes when we're repenting, we're not just repenting of our response to someone else. We might be repenting of our own judgment against God's character that we've established in our heart that you're not good or you're not powerful or you're not mindful or you don't see me or you don't care or whatever it is. When we address our own heart first, then the Lord will also uncover those places where we have offenses against him. And can I tell you that in our emotional health, the place the enemy wants us to doubt the emotional security and the goodness and the, the, the faithfulness that we need to rely on most is our belief in God's character. Because if we do not have our established understanding of God's character, then where do we go when we understand what we have not received? When we work on on this repentance and we get to forgive ourselves, then we can begin extending forgiveness to other people. Because we get to realize in my own pain, I've not handled my reactions well. And my reactions in my own pain often have hurt other people too. I'll tell you this, when I was younger, and you can, again, read all about it. Um, when I was younger, there's this passage of scripture, Proverbs 27, 7. And while I'm sharing this, if the worship team can begin to make their way up. Proverbs 27, 7 says this, to him who is well-fed, honey is not desirable or sweet, but to him who is starving, the bitter thing will seem to taste sweet. And so in my own brokenness, I began like going and doing things and, and getting in relational dynamics with people and, and doing stuff that, that was actually really super unhealthy, but it was ministering and feeding a place in my own heart. And when I did begin to address that with the Lord and repent myself, what I began to understand is in my brokenness, I hurt and used other people. I certainly didn't start out with that mentality in mind. None of us do. But nevertheless, if I was honest with myself, in my brokenness, I spilled my brokenness out on other people too. And when I got to that place of humility to understand, God, it's not just the people that have hurt me that need grace, it's me. I need grace. I need to repent. I need healing. So when you're in that spot of personal responsibility, somehow when you start approaching the things that other people have done, you just have way more of an open hand of forgiveness because you are looking at things through a lens. 
not of pride or self-righteousness, but of true humility. Okay, so extending forgiveness to those that have hurt us can be incredibly hard. And and primarily for the, the biggest reasons, like I said before, those strongholds that we've set up in our heart and mind that lead us to interpret how God will respond, like, is God for us, not against us? And, and what do I do? Do I just let go of this thing that hurt me so deeply? How many of you ever struggled with that? Where you have been, raise your hand high if this is you, where you have come to a place where you know the Lord is asking you in, in spiritual maturity to let something go, but the question in your mind is, God, but what about me? Raise your hand high if that's been you. Come on, friends in this, come on, friends. Listen, my in-laws, again, I see your hand down here. I want to see it up here. <laughs> can, can, you all, can you all recognize this is not, the enemy is not creative. He takes us all down the same way. We're going to sing a song and we're going to continue to worship. And I don't want it just to be a moment to sing words and check out. The song we're singing is called The Sound Mind. A Sound Mind. And can I say that our emotional health starts first and foremost with what we believe about who God is. And the place that we need that transformation, the place where we first need transformation to encounter us is our understanding of God's character. Because when we understand that he is for us and not against us, when we understand that whatever has happened, he is the redeemer. He is the one that gives beauty for ashes. He is the one who sees the deficits and the injustices in our lives and he hates them and he wants to address them. He is the good judge. We go to him for our compensation and for our recompense. We don't go to our own hands. We can't, we can't produce anything redemptive. So as we worship, I wanna challenge you to do this. Pray that prayer from Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And let me say this, that word offensive, sometimes I think we can read this passage of scripture and we read it through a lens where we feel like the Lord is looking at us with condemnation. See if there's any offensive to you way in me, Lord. And instead, can we just flip that script a little bit and say, Lord, can you show me any offense I have against you? Can you show me any offensive way that I have agreed with the enemy to look at your heart and your character towards me? Because I don't want that, Lord. I want a clean heart and a sound mind. It's these places where we don't believe his character, where fear sets in. It's these places where we don't believe his heart for us, where we take matters into our own hands and we medicate the pain and we shove emotion down and we run screaming from the building. But can I tell you that the Lord is so good to us. He is so faithful to us. If there's anything in your heart today that there is an offense against the good heart of God, Can we just repent of that today? As we worship, communion is gonna be set up in the back. The very physical example that Jesus called us to do to remember his broken body, broken for us, his blood shed for the forgiveness and purification of sin, that he has come not just to purify, redeem and restore the sins we've committed, but also the sins committed against us and the sins that we've committed in our own heart against the heart of God, can we this morning allow the Lord to examine our hearts, speak to us, and then go to the table where we can be tangibly understanding this exchange of forgiveness for this, these things. Can we rid them of our hearts and our minds today? Amen? So do this for me. It's a little easier to be engaged if we actually are engaged. So please stand. And as the worship team leads us, let the Holy Spirit lead you. Amen.
In the chaos, you are the peace. In my suffering, you're here with me. In the darkness, you never leave. God of mercy, you're walking with me. I surrender anxiety. All the striving has to cease. In this moment, you're still the king. This is the gift you are giving to me. A sound mind for the spirit of fear. A sound mind so that I can see clear. A sound mind, your spirit is here. A sound mind, a sound mind. There's a table where we meet in the presence of my enemies I will listen and I will feast on every word you are speaking to me I remember who you are you're my fortress and my guide I will stand in authority in Jesus name all this darkness will flee a sound mind for the spirit of fear a sound mind so that i can see clearly a sound mind your spirit is here a sound mind a sound mind a sound mind for the spirit of fear a sound mind so that i can see You saved, healed, delivered me. Jesus' blood washed over me. Command my soul awake, arise. Use each breath to prophesy. I prophesy. You saved, healed, delivered me. Jesus' blood washed over me. Command my soul awake. A sound mind, a sound mind, a sound mind for the spirit of fear. A sound mind so that I can see clearly. A sound mind, your spirit is here. A sound mind, a sound mind.
Jesus for this time together today. We thank you that you're not done in this moment that you continue to be at work, that you go with us, you lead us out of this place. And we do, we, we prophesy your truth. And what that means is when we can grab a hold of the truth of God's character, his nature, his purposes, and his word, and we can begin to speak that truth out. We allow it to be something that we then step into. So that's what we're doing today is we're just declaring the truth of God, his character, his nature, his purposes, his intentions, his redemptive work, the power that is alive in us as we've given our hearts and minds and lives to Jesus. God, that we would be transformed as we're looking at this emotionally healthy spirituality, that we would 
understand that the root of it is in Paul's heart that said that we would be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that is truly what you're doing. We offer our minds to be transformed by your truth, our minds that have been formed by our experiences, our pasts, our journeys, our thoughts have been formed by those. And so we give our minds and our thoughts to you that as you become king of our thoughts and our lives and as you redeem them, restore them, that that is truly the catalyst for transformation. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for every heart and life that's here, that's on the stream, that's been with us today. We ask that you would continue to do this work that you're doing in us, that it would spill over into every life and every community that we encounter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. We love you guys. Thank you for joining us. I want to give you a next step. And this is specific for men in the house because the ladies have, um, they have an emotionally healthy journey that they're on in a class that they're already doing and that's already part way through. But men, we are starting a head to heart class um, group for men. Um, Pete's going to be heading that up. Pete. And so... Uh, we would love to invite men to be a part of that. If you're saying, yes, I, I want to I go on this journey of emotional health. I want to go on this journey of sharing and understanding my thoughts and my responses, my reactions, and surrendering them to Jesus. Um, Pete's going to be in the, in the lobby this morning. And so, men, I would, I would challenge you to, to uh, sign up for Head to Heart with Pete and connect with him. All right? Okay. We love you guys. Have a great morning. Have a great Sunday. You're awesome.